screen. So with that, I want to turn the mic over to Avi Gopstein, Smart Grid Manager at NIST. He'll be providing his perspective on cybersecurity for the Smart Grid. Avi, mic is yours. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, let me just get my presentation up for everybody to see. All right, how's that going? Can everybody see that? Okay, um, so uh, my name is Avi Gopsi. I'm the Smart Grid Program Manager at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I'm very happy to be here uh, today to have this uh, discussion with you. Um, I'm gonna begin with a quick introduction of NIST for those of you who may not be familiar with the organization or our Smart Grid Research Program. Uh, this is to give you some context for our cybersecurity activities. Uh, we'll then move into a brief discussion of the updated NIST Smart Grid Interoperability Framework and some of the tools that we've created uh, to help everyone understand and talk about the dynamic changes that are ongoing in the, in the grid. Uh, then uh, we'll get into the cybersecurity training part of this talk uh, where I'll get into our work on how to secure utilities and other power sector organizations, uh, and then how we think about uh, mapping our strategies to the NERC-SIP requirements, and then how uh, we address the challenge of securing uh, all these new interfaces that are appearing throughout the system. So NIST is pretty old. Uh, and from the start, we have been focused on helping things work better for the American consumer and industry. Uh, and from the start, we've been involved with standards for the electrical industry. Uh, our mission today is to use measurement science to inform standards that drive technical innovation through the US economy. So why is measurement science the first thing we talk about in a chain that leads to driving innovation? Because NIST believes that you must first be able to measure something before you can optimize it. And because without that measurement, you'll never know if you made an improvement or not. So in short, measurements are the foundation of both the problem statements that describe the work that needs to be done and the measurements that are also the way we assess the value of the new technologies that solve the problems we face. And in fact, measurement has long been a part of what government does uh, from the very beginning. And measurement combined with technical standards are critically important to all forms of commerce, the electric grid included. So why is NIST doing the framework for smart grid interoperability, right? Why that? Um, the short answer is uh, because Congress told us to, right? So here's some language from the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, in which Congress assigned NIST the responsibility of developing the interoperability framework. Uh, but, but, but I think that these are the really important points of uh, that mission, right? Our job is to modernize the grid. We're not doing this just to keep the old grid running. We're doing it to help modernize the grid. NIST is supposed to coordinate the development of the framework, not write it in isolation. So we work with stakeholders and contributors across the power sector and use their inputs to inform the ideas that we expressed in this most recent framework. The framework must focus on enabling all electric resources to be part of the solution, not just the legacy equipment that's already there, not just the new technologies that are coming online, but everything together. And in that light, we cannot focus on any single solution, nor can we ignore the role that the existing infrastructure plays in keeping the system running. But I also want to highlight this word interoperability, right? This is what NIST is focused on. And it is, it's a pretty important topic, right? So, but, but what exactly is it? For context, I'm gonna, we're gonna look into a little bit of the background information uh, right now, right? So the question is what exactly is interoperability? Uh, we have our definition that's in the framework in the upper left, in the upper left-hand corner. It's um, the ability of two or more systems or applications to securely and effectively exchange and readily use information with little or no user inconvenience, all right? And that's important. But conceptually, the most important thing to understand is that interoperability is a tool for unlocking new value across the power system. That value can come from improved operations and efficiencies or avoided costs due to decreased outages or integration of new resources and economic opportunities into energy markets. In fact, as our grid modernizes, the opportunity to gain value from interoperability grows with every new data stream or communication action. The Gridwise Architecture Council estimated the US power sector could save $10 billion each year 
through improved interoperability. But we heard at our testing and certification workshop that we held in 2018 in the lead up to this most recent framework that a single OEM spends a billion dollars a year on integrating non-interoperable devices into their R&D laboratories. And a single IOU spends $140 million each year trying to get new but non-interoperable systems to work together. Right? These costs have to be paid. And we know that in the power system, eventually they're borne by the consumer. Uh, and so this is, a, is, is when we put it in those terms and when considering the economic opportunity that each customer can embrace by integrating their technologies and resources into the system, right? Just look at for quarter 2222, the value proposition may be much higher than we ever thought before. So right now, I, I want to ask the question, how important is the relationship between interoperability and cybersecurity, right? So the traditional uh, uh, utility approach to interoperability is to decrease the integration costs for new equipment. EPRI published a paper on this in 2017, uh, uh, co-authored by uh, um, some folks uh, at utilities. And, and to be honest, um, th the truth is that just integrating new devices is a, is a fairly low bar for the value of interoperability. And it's actually one um, uh, that the typical utility revenue structure uh, may undermine, right? So you see utilities are compensated best for capital expenses in, in, in many cases. Uh, and when integration costs are folded into procurement, the cost of overcoming non-interoperability between utility systems becomes a profit maker for the utility. So the structure of a traditional tariff, which compensates utilities more for capital expenditures than for O&M, creates uh, a, a kind of a negative incentive for utilities to keep their equipment integration expenses high. And while making equipment integrations more expensive is certainly not any utility's foremost goal, it may mean that the dollars and cents of improving interoperability also will not rise to the top of a utility's priority list if it undermines certain aspects of a conventional business model. So contrast that to how interoperability enables consumers to pursue any number of value propositions, right? By managing their energy consumption and contributions, consumers can pursue environmental benefits, financial benefits, resilience benefits, and improve their ability to develop new opportunities through collaboration and coordination with others. These all require unique information exchange. And so interoperability empowers consumers to seek and develop their own value-driven priorities. But in this quest to interact with others, interoperability does something more. It's about more than exchanging the typical energy demand for billing data. It's about unlocking the physical capability of equipment to do something more than it was originally intended to do, right? Consider the thermostat. The purpose of a thermostat is to control the temperature in a room by actuating an HVAC in response to measured temperature changes. That's it. It's specific in what it measures and in how it works. But now consider a communications enabled thermostat that is interoperable with other systems. That thermostat can be used to manage distribution system congestion, thereby preventing circuit overload and improving system resilience. Or that thermostat could be used to clean our environment and balance variable generation renewables, timing its on cycles for when carbon free power is available. Or that thermostat can decrease heating and cooling costs by pre cooling to avoid peak rates. And if we think about utility equipment, interoperability is a hedge against obsolescence. Equipment that lasts extra long tends to be extra specified. This makes it even more challenging to have that equipment do anything other than what it was originally purchased to do. Just as consumer equipment benefits by breaking asset specificity, utility equipment can be more versatile and work longer under different operating conditions by enabling communications. Using standard communication protocols to support interoperability therefore decreases the likelihood that still functioning equipment will become either a stranded asset or a reason to avoid system upgrades. So I wanna take a quick uh, aside and give a little context, right? Let's talk about the role of the DER uh, play on our systems and how interoperability might relate to that topic, right? So here you can see some of the inverter functions uh, that NIST identified in the framework as being required either by IEEE 1547 or California Rule 21. Uh, what's important to understand is that when IEEE 1547 was first published in 2003, there was literally only one requirement, the first, and that was to disconnect from the grid when things went wrong. In fact, by the time 1547 was revised in 2014, only the first two functions were required and a few others were suggested 
as possible capabilities inverters might want to accommodate. But by 2018, when we compile, compiled this list, we found 36 different functions that were either already required by standards, including the new 1547, or will soon be required by standards. We've got grid following and grid forming, voltage support and frequency support. We've got ride through and power factor and normal versus emergency operations. And with the wide open communications and data space allowed by the standards, it's not clear to me that we have a complete understanding of how we should best communicate to fully leverage all these new capabilities. Right? I'm fairly certain that interoperability has something to do with it because we'll need to find ways to exchange the information between devices and systems to observe and manage all these fabulous capabilities, right? But this is an issue that needs to be uh, resolved. So um, our latest framework version four has six sections, which you can see here. Uh, if anybody wants to talk about our models or the ontology we created for the grid, uh, I'm happy to dive into them at your convenience. But for our conversation, I wanna focus on these uh, uh, three sections. We're gonna talk very briefly, briefly about the models we use to understand the smart grid and emerging requirements. And then we're gonna dive into cybersecurity and some resources we've made available to help folks understand best practices and the relationship with cybersecurity requirements for power systems. And we're also gonna talk about the standards landscape and how we can improve the availability of testing and certification and how that relates to protecting individual cyber uh, interfaces uh, using cybersecurity best practices. So one of the most important things the framework does is help us think about the smart grid, both where we are and where we need to get to. Uh, to help us do that, the framework provides a few models. Importantly, uh, a conceptual model has undergone meaningful updates for this framework and the communication pathway scenarios are completely new as is our ontology for the grid. So uh, NIST hopes that these tools will help us all work to modernize our grid and system. Uh, here you can see the smart grid conceptual model, which has been consistently updated uh, for the framework. A couple things to note. There are seven domains on the system. The power flows that are indicated by the dotted yellow lines are relatively simple compared to the communication flows indicated by the blue lines that flow uh, between uh, you know, almost all of these domains in a variety of uh, combinatorially complex uh, iterations. Um, some changes in this version are that we have more automation, sensing and control in the distribution system, diversification among the generation, including distributed energy resources and customer diversification. Uh, but this is an extremely high level of abstraction that doesn't allow us to say much that is meaningful. And so each of these uh, domains has uh, a detailed diagram describing uh, more important information. So here you can see the generation including DER domain, which uh, is of course dominated by power flows. But what's important in this updated version of the model is threefold. One, meaningful power is now generated and introduced directly to the distribution system. Two, customers participate in the solution space, but their primary, primary objective for their resource may be something other than pure generation. And three, depending on the scale of the resource, it will be introduced at different points within the generation domain, right? So these are just some of the important concepts that we try to convey with the updated model. And we do it through a tiered communication and, st and structural model approach uh, uh, illustrated by these cartoons. Um, here we go. Uh, and so just to emphasize, we have one of these uh, conceptual diagrams uh, for each domain. I, I don't expect that you're gonna go through uh, all of these or even be able to read them on this. They're all in the report, you can look at them. Um, but what we really wanna understand is how do these models help us better understand where communication happens on the system, what the interoperability requirements might be, and how we should protect it through cybersecurity. So to address that question, we developed a series of communication pathway scenarios like the one you see here. Uh, these scenarios are used to examine the types of network pathways and infrastructure and information exchanges that might be employed for any one scenario. So here you can see our high DER penetration scenario where internet and IP routable communications are critical to incorporating the many different devices we expect to see deployed and utilized across the system. And also the different gateways we should prioritize for normalizing interoperability standards and processes, and even the different uh, nested control loops that we need to consider as devices and systems exchange information at different levels. Um, and I'll note that in this framework, we adopt a scenario driven set of analyses because not any single scenario is correct. So while we call this one our high DER scenario, 
Um, as we look into the emerging diversity across the electrical system, we can see um, you know, that there are many scenarios to consider and things are getting uh, really, really complicated. Um, you know, in fact, these scenarios are inspired by the Department of Energy's reference grid architectures. We're not going out here and saying, you know, uh, uh, by ourselves, this is what we think the future is going to be. We looked at the DOE's reference architectures and we tried to understand what it meant from an interoperability standpoint and a grid modernization standpoint. And we tried to characterize some of those ideas in these diagrams. Uh, but with more complex systems, we also need a more precise language for describing what we're going to do with the system. So we create an ontology for the system based on nine aspects and 51 individual concerns for a cyber physical system. So we don't have time to go through all of these words today, but for example, let's just consider, you know, how many different aspects of the grid relate to a term like intelligence, right? So let's think about this. Lots of people talk about moving intelligence to the edge of the grid, right? But what does that mean? So we, we think that intelligence relates to each of these aspects and concerns and having more precise language will help us talk about and establish uh, requirements for this and many other capabilities emerging throughout the system. And so using this cyber uh, physical systems framework, we develop this dictionary of terms and relationships or an ontology for the grid that allows us to be more precise in how we talk about what we want, what we need and, and what we're trying to do. Um, we held a lot of workshops around the country in, in preparing this uh, um, framework. And I was actually surprised at the number of people who thought that this ontology was one of the biggest contributions uh, of this current framework. So that's it for the background, right? What NIST is, why we're doing this, uh, um, why we've done the framework. I, we can take a, a few minutes for uh, questions, um, Ashton. Uh, uh, and then um, move into the next section where we'll start talking about some of the specific cybersecurity guidance. Hi, Avi. I do have one question here uh, from Tracy Condi. She asks, um, can you explain interoperability a little bit more? If two systems aren't interoperable, then how can they work together? Well, I mean, that's, that's really it. The, the, the problem with interoperability is that most people know it when it's not there, right? Most, most people understand interoperability by the things that can't get done. If, this, if the systems or devices cannot communicate, then by definition, they're not interoperable. Our definition is not, but our definition is not just about the exchange of information, right? That communicating data. It's also about making that actionable. The important part of interoperability is that it should, it should enable and stimulate something else to be done, not just that information is transmitted and stored. So it's more than just the communications. It's about the physical interactions of the system and it's about the exchange of the data. And we'll actually get to that in the, uh, the fourth unit of uh, today's conversation. Perfect, thanks Avi. I just had one question of my own as well. Uh, when you're working with interoperability, how does NIST work with uh, you know, other federal partners such as DOE or, uh, or, other, or DHS? We, uh, we partner with external, uh, other federal uh, uh, agencies uh, quite a lot. Um, we interact with DOE on an agency to agency level, but also I have um, uh, CRADA's Cooperative Research and Development Agreements with several of the DOE national labs. So we'll work with DOE uh, at the higher level strategy or policy sometimes um, you know, we, we uh, uh, jointly work on projects or uh, advise each other. Uh, but then when it comes time to doing the actual uh, technical work, uh, NIST will partner directly with a DOE national lab in order to leverage both of our capabilities, our unique capabilities to uh, advance some research. And we have, we have a lot going on uh, with um, you know, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and many other ones. Um, as far as uh, the Smart Grid and Cyber Physical Systems group uh, at NIST, uh, the reach into other agencies expands even much uh, farther, including into DHS and some of the other uh, departments. Great, thanks, Avi. I have one more question, then we can move on to the next session. Section. Uh, Kimberly Jones asks, can you show us the communications pathway and meter information for implementing FERC order 2222? Does it exist? <laughs> Um, I'm not going to uh, get into prescribing how uh, uh, FERC Order 20, uh, 2222 should be implemented. Um, 
Um, I, what I can say is that uh, smart meter interoperability was one of the five priority interfaces identified uh, by stakeholders in our very in our various workshops. It wasn't number one on the list. So right now we're working on developing interoperability profiles for some of the other interfaces first. And as we go through those and have our proof of concepts uh, and demonstration of the ability and value of these types of approaches, we'll then migrate to uh, additional uh, priority interfaces.